Hi everyone, uh, this is Professor D'Angelo. We're here for our next installment on the Early American History Podcast. So today we're going to be focused on Chapter 6 of the Tyndall and She book, but um, it's referred to by uh, many historians as the so-called critical period. And this is a term that um, was uh, put forward by John Quincy Adams in a speech that he gave to Harvard, in which he basically described the dilemma of uh, where the United States stood at the point of 18, uh, excuse me, 1783. So with the American independence, uh, you end up with 13 states, but it didn't really create a new nation. In fact, the Declaration of Independence doesn't even mention the word nation. So Americans were so concerned about the abuse of power that they had experienced under the British that they intentionally created a new government that was protective of the 13 American states and their independence from one another. So the government created under the revolution and, and uh, was called a confederation government because of the Articles of Confederation that outlined its provisions but did not have a president and did not have a chief executive at all and it did not have a judiciary. So it didn't have a lot of the powers that we were going to talk about. And so John Quincy Adams was calling the period from 18, roughly the period from 1783 until 1800 is what is considered by many to be the, uh, the critical period. Some, some historians, and I tend to agree with them a little bit, extends that out to 1815, which is the end of the War of 1812, uh, for various reasons that I hope will be clear towards the end of this um, unit. So um, when we look at the Articles of Confederation, these were ratified in 1781, but they were actually drafted in 1776. So throughout the revolution, the uh, Continental Congress operated under the rules spelled out in the Articles of Confederation. So uh, the so-called critical period was really in reference to uh, trying to figure out just exactly what kind of government we were going to live under. And uh, we talk about the Articles of Confederation as our first technical constitution. Um, and, and then uh, they, both internally and externally. So externally, what governments, right? Who out there in the world was going to accept the United States? Because remember, we were embarking on a radically different form of government, particularly within the Western uh, experience, right? The Western um, uh, theories of government. So we were choosing not to have a monarchy and we were choosing to have a decentralized distribution of power, meaning that the states were going to have more power than the central government. And was that going to be enough for that central government to be respected by other countries. And certainly we were surrounded, right, by uh, different powers, namely the Spanish and the, and the British. And so um, the, the next big question was going to be what was going to happen with the rivalries between the states? And um, in, in particular, uh, it's the northern and southern uh, these these differences were very, very, very highlighted during the um, Constitutional Convention that we'll talk about. Uh, and it was there in the, in the Declaration of Independence period. These were southern states with very sparsely spread out populations based on uh, cash crop agriculture and slave labor. Uh, northern states were heading more in the direction of industrialization and what was then considered the early industrial revolution. And so there were definite rivalries there, but there were also rivalries between smaller states and larger states. There were rivalries between Virginia and New York that had really nothing to do with slavery, but rather to do with um, uh, size of representation and claims to Western lands. So there's all sorts of different rivalries that were going on that uh, really spelled big question marks for this new government. So in terms of finance, there was a growing national debt. Uh, the, um, the borrowing by the national government, so the Continental Congress, uh, in it, by itself had $54 million in debt. And then the states respectively had an additional 21 million in total uh, debt outlays. Uh, 
And this led to uh, problems in finance because there was no centralized currency. There was something called the Continental, which was uh, issued by the Congress. By 1783, it was such a weak um, form of currency that it actually was a, a, a phrase used to denote something of no value. So if you saw something that was really cheap, you would say, well, that's not even worth a continental, which, you know, that's pretty bad right? when, when uh, people do that. So as you can see by this map, uh, the size of the United States doubles with the Treaty of Paris of 1783. And this is great news for this new country, but it came with all sorts of additional problems. So um, the, uh, the new government, and by the new government, I mean the Continental Government or the uh, Continental Congress, is going to move forward with its powers uh, in order to um, you know, try to make this all work. And the way I'd like you to sort of think about it is uh, this, this expansion of land, right? The, the more than doubling of the territory, right? Meant that the government could turn to land sales as a form of income rather than issuing taxes. And, and this is pretty critical because uh, if you remember... Our revolution was really ignited because of a tax revolt. So were the states or the federal national government going to increase taxes, there was always the risk that the people would rebel against it. So um, so the, the land policy really is the only thing that goes well for the Continental Congress. Virtually all other areas they really were terrible at. And so... Um, uh, the easy source of income for the Congress was just simply to advertise, uh, you know, affordable land sales out West and that was going to do great. Right. So there, there was already a demand. So you go all the way back to the founding of the colonies and there was always the desire to go farther West. So for every new generation, there was sort of a call to have additional lands for sale so that they could move out to these new areas, right? There's only so much agricultural land available and at some point you run out. And here, uh, over a million acres was going to be uh, you know, put out there. Now, the problem was though, the state rivalries were preventing a lot of the sales from moving forward. So as you saw on that previous map, uh, Virginia claimed all the land that surrounded the Ohio River Valley. Well, you know, if you're New York, you thought it belonged to you. Even Connecticut claimed land in the West. Everybody had claims. So what happened was um, the Continental Congress became a basically a deliberation body to try to settle the disputes between those, those various states. And essentially what happened was the newer and smaller states said that they would refuse to ratify the Articles of Confederation unless this land dispute issue was resolved. And the result of it was something called the Land Ordinance. And this is in 1785. And so what happens here is all the states agreed that the land in the northwestern part of the country, which today is the Midwest, would be surrendered or ceded to the national government. So all the states gave up their claims to this land and all of it reverted to the Continental Congress. And they stated that these lands would not be colonies. And that's another major thing, right? So uh, th these weren't going to be colonies of this new government. They were going to be future states with equal rights and powers of the other states. Something that had really never been done before. And so Congress passed this law and all the states gave up their land claims and the money made from these land sales was going to go towards reducing the debt that the Congress had issued. And this was really phenomenal. And so um, 
when when people talk about American exceptionalism and and you know the idea that Americans were were really very blessed, this is a very good example because if the government had really needed to tax people to the degree necessary to get rid of that debt, it would have been a significant burden on the American taxpayer and it would not have gone over well, I don't think at all. And on top of that, this debt that they had, $54 million, was really oppressive had this land not been given to the federal government, to the national government for sale. So that's the land ordinance. It's followed up by the Northwest Ordinance. And the Northwest Ordinance is critical because it organizes how the land would actually be allotted. So this was the first allotment of land to be open for settlement with the premise that once settlers comprised a certain number, which was about 1,500, they would be allowed to enter the Union as a state, uh, or excuse me, as a territory. Uh, then the government would issue a territorial governor and a judge, and they would be allowed to organize a territorial government. And then once they reached 60,000 residents, uh, they would... Um, uh, have a convention to draft a state constitution, and then they would submit that constitution to the Congress uh, for admission as a new state. So uh, the other major proviso here, and again, this is critical, I think, for the longer narrative, uh, slavery was to be outlawed in these territories. And what's interesting is uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson has a major role in this uh, law. In fact, he he drafts the land ordinance. I'm not sure if he's totally in charge of the land Northwest Ordinance or not. But um, <clears throat> as you can see here, it's a large piece of territory. And this is going to make an incredible difference uh, in, in, in the future. And to think that all of this will be designated free territory. And this is at a point, by the way, where no state in the Union had outlawed slavery at this point. So this was, um, this is originally the thinking of the framers and the founding fathers of this country. Most of them believed, and I know this sounds bizarre, but most of them believed that slavery was going to disappear as an institution. Even Southern slave owners thought that at some point slavery was going to no longer be profitable and doable and therefore uh, not sustainable. And so um, the Northwest Ordinance reflected this collective assumption and basically set the ground for um, the gradual elimination of slavery from, from the Union. Uh, and obviously this does not happen and uh, we'll get into why later. So now the new nation had to develop a diplomatic core and they had to get out there and some negotiating some treaties for economic and political alliances. And all the Treaty of Paris of 1783 had ended the war for independence and stipulated that that Britain must leave the Northwest Territory it it re uh, Britain retained a certain a number of forts in, in the Northwest Territories. When confronted with this problem, England countered uh, their former colonies that they had not paid their debts, right? So uh, this, this lack of authority to negotiate foreign treaties really comes from the weakness of the documents themselves. So... The Articles of Confederation, the Continental Congress had no power to tax. So every year the Continental Congress would draft up its budget and it would uh, allocate a certain number to each state according to their representation and essentially ask them if they wouldn't mind paying their bill. Well, this was not a good way to obtain revenue. And could have been, and it was a major problem because uh, foreign banks, foreign governments, and private individuals and private um, merchants were all clamoring to have their war debts paid. And uh, without a, a reliable stream of revenue, this this wasn't going to happen. And um, the Congress could not declare war. Uh, the states possessed all the sovereignty. So if um, uh, 
if the Continental Congress passed a law, it was up to the state governors to enforce the law. And it was up to state courts to, dis- to interpret the law as to whether it was constitutional or not. And this, this created a number of problems. So from the British perspective, the Continental Congress was not very strong. In fact, it was, it was quite weak. And so um, they kept troops on American soil and they started to incite Indians, particularly in the Northwest Territory, and, and quite literally paying Indians per scalp, no questions asked. And this was done to um, force the Americans to confront the reality that trying to keep um, control of Indians was um, not as easy as you think it is. Now, uh, George Washington is going to have to send uh, uh, lead troops into the area. We're going to get uh, two treaties with Indians in this time period, Fort Stanwix and, and um, uh, Fort um, uh, Green, Green, I believe it is. And they, these are um, uh, treaties with the Shawnee primarily, but other Indian and the Miami tribes to essentially sell their land to the United States and to uh, live on uh, reserved land for themselves, what we now call reservations. And so um, the British basically cr- close trade with the United States. So what you want to do here is you want to remember that Great Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, they're still operating under mercantilism. So that means any, any products coming from a foreign country have to have a tariff attached to them which of course is going to make American products more expensive. So the idea here is the British decide to close off trade altogether. So if you remember in unit one, we talked about how American uh, merchant ships liked to go into the Caribbean, the West Indies, and just sort of like openly trade with other islands and other colonies, even those that weren't British colonies. Well, that's done. The, the British, the French, the Dutch, they all close off all American trade. So if Americans want to trade with the West Indies, they're being forced to send their products first to Europe, to England, to the Netherlands, to France, right? And then there's a tax assigned to it. And then the, the uh, mother country processes it into some sort of finished good, which is then s- sold to the West Indies. So this is a huge uh, economic stigma for the the Americans trying to move forward. And we eventually try to uh, negotiate a treaty under George Washington, which we'll talk about it. For the Spanish, the problem had to do with um, the the Mississippi River. So I stated that the um, territorial concessions of the Treaty of Paris were very favorable to the United States because it doubled the size. And it stretched our borders from the Atlantic to the Mississippi River. Problem, the West Bank of the Mississippi was owned by Spain. And Spain did not like the United States at all. So Spain also held Florida and an area stretching from it into Louisiana. So the Treaty of Paris decreed that the American citizens were allowed to ship goods down the Mississippi. But in 1784, Spanish governor of Louisiana closed the port of New Orleans where goods shipped south would be reloaded onto seaworthy ships to the United States. So if you can sort of imagine, uh, we were technically allowed to navigate the river, but the mouth of the river, which is New Orleans, was closed to us. So it's kind of one of those, you know, non sequiturs. If you, if you can't get out of New Orleans, then what's the point of navigating the Mississippi? Now, this is a catastrophe for what all those people who were um, frontiersmen who had crossed the Appalachians into the western part of now the United States. It was cheaper to float their produce down, bar- down the Mississippi River in barges. And then literally they would load their uh, products into Navy or excuse me, deep sea ships. And then they would dismantle the barges and trek them back up north where they would reassemble them and reload them and send them down south again. Well, if you can't use the port of New Orleans, there's no point 
and this is a major catastrophe for um, the the new uh, growing parts of the American frontier. So um, this these these issues are going to have to be negotiated. But as long as the Continental Congress was proving itself to be weak and unstable, there was no incentive by any of the European powers to take uh, them seriously as as a government. And this this greatly affected American foreign policy. So, uh, a problem arises in Massachusetts. Now, Shays' Rebellion is really at the tail end of a number of years of other types of problems. Primarily, they were economic. So, if you can... <clears throat> kind of sort it through and, and it's in the narrative if you're kind of paying attention there were something like nine different currencies circulating in the United States there were at least ten different banking laws every state could have its own tariff meaning tax on imports and some states actually taxed imports from other states so Massachusetts and, and uh, Connecticut had trade wars with New York, and New York and New Hampshire fought over Vermont, and therefore raised. I mean, it was it was craziness, right? And um, so, what happened is in um, in 1785, the the state of Massachusetts decided that it needed to pay off its debts which was a perfectly logical thing for them to, to, to do. Uh, because they were the first to start fighting the British, they had the oldest and the largest debt of any state in the Union. And the Massachusetts situation was particularly delicate because when all of those trade rules go into place that I said in the in the previous slide, right, where we were not allowed to trade with the West Indies and the Spanish colonies and then the Spanish, you know, cut off the, the port of New Orleans. These were New Englanders mostly. So it was mostly people from Massachusetts who were sailing these ships and they're now being denied access to major trade routes. And this is, this is going to cause literally a depression in Massachusetts, really throughout all of New England, but Massachusetts is particularly struck hard. And so, um, it's a double whammy of negative realities for Massachusetts. They need to pay off debt at the same time that their people are earning significantly less money. And so the problem emerges that this deep depression uh, causes economic hardships on most of the citizens of Massachusetts. But in order to pay off their debt to foreign and domestic uh, creditors, they needed to raise property taxes because that's how you collected taxes. Taxes were on property. And so the rebellion, as it's referred to, was uh, really involved trying to block the courts from foreclosing on farmers who hadn't paid their property taxes. That's, that's really what's happening. So uh, Daniel Shea was a former Revolutionary War veteran who was struggling to pay off his property taxes on his farm. And uh, they tried to get the legislature to accept payment in kind, which basically meant uh, Shea and his followers wanted to uh, give produce from their farm to the state and in lieu of payment. But th this wasn't going to work, right? Because the state of Massachusetts was raising the revenue in order to pay off debts to banks and, and private individuals. And they weren't going to accept produce in lieu of payment. They wanted, they wanted gold, right? They wanted payment. And so that was re refused. Uh, others wanted the payments to be deferred over a longer period of time, which again, the, the, the state was feeling compelled to pay quickly and they weren't going to accept it. So, the armed resistance was literally an, an army surrounding courthouses to prevent these foreclosure trials from actually 
taking place. And the result was chaos. Now, if you can remember back when I discussed enlightenment thinking, this is the worst possible world in the enlightenment thinking, right? It's, it's the reason why government gets in, uh, put in place in order to restore order out of the chaos. So Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts asks for help. They, they reach out to the Continental Congress and say, look, we need to, you to send uh, an army up here to help us put down this rebellion. Well, there was nothing in the Articles of Confederation giving the central government power to do such a thing, and so they refuse. And this leaves Massachusetts to t- take it on themselves. And at first, it looked like it wasn't going to work. In fact, it looked like the rebellion might spread to places like Rhode Island and Connecticut and New Hampshire. Uh, but the Massachusetts militia finally is able to put down the rebellion. And, uh, but, but news of this rebellion circulates through all of the 13 states. And fear began to emerge that the federal government or the national government was too weak to keep order. And so um, we get uh, James Madison... Uh, who is considered the father of the Constitution and the author of the Bill of Rights. And he is going to play a major role in this uh, workings. So what happens? In 1785, a group of people who were worried about this chaotic situation uh, went to Mount Vernon to meet with George Washington to discuss various... um, potential remedies. And George Washington was like, look, I I can't be involved in this, right? But you guys should really get together with more people, invite delegates from states to discuss these problems. And so they do. Um, Approximately, I want to say five states, maybe as many as seven, send uh, delegates to um, Annapolis, Maryland. And they go there to um, discuss some of the problems with the document, the Articles of Confederation. Leading this is Alexander Hamilton. And Hamilton is a businessman. He's a banker. He's very much into the speculation for these Western lands. I mean, he's very pro, yes, America. And as a nationalist, he was terrified by Shays Rebellion and absolutely appalled by all of the economic uh, rivalry that was going on between the states. And he's going to become a leader of a group that are going to call themselves the Federalists. So, uh, the group at Annapolis comes up with, it's referred to as the Annapolis Plan, drafted by Hamilton, where they list out a number of problems with the Articles of Confederation, and they call on all of the states to send delegates to a constitutional convention. This is going to be held in Philadelphia in 1787. And um, now, uh, the delegates in attendance were rather sporadic. Um, most, Most of them were late. And then many didn't even stay for all of the deliberations. And in fact, Hamilton himself comes for like the first day and then he just gives like a, I want to say it's something like a six or eight hour speech, which is just torturing, and then leaves. Uh, and and uh, and just kind of reports back periodically to see whether his ideas are getting anywhere. Uh, James Madison really emerges here now. He's only 36 um, at the time of the convention and he's only like five foot four and he's tiny and, and not very vocal, but he has an unbelievably, uh, gifted mind and his, uh, his knowledge of detail is really just indispensable to the members he shows up before the convention starts in Philadelphia. He brings trunk loads of uh, books on forms of government, on uh, some of the Greek and Roman observations of government. And um, he is going to draft uh, the, the first <clears throat> proposal on the document. 
So what I'd like you to do on this is to be able to look at the sort of progression. When the delegates arrive in May of 1787, the purpose is to amend the Articles of Confederation. So the Annapolis plan called on people to come to Philadelphia to figure out how they were going to fix the articles. When they get there, they realized it can't be done. And that's because anytime you wanted to amend the Articles of Confederation, it required a unanimous vote. All 13 states had to agree. And Rhode Island was notorious for saying no just because they feared that the uh, central government was going to become too powerful. So they realized that they couldn't do it. Um, Hamilton had something like 38 suggested amendments to the articles. And it just this was never, it wasn't going to work. So the decision comes to scrap the articles and start all over again. And this created problems in and of itself. Uh, founding fathers like Patrick Henry will stand up and denounce that as, as absolute treason and said that uh, he could not support it because it, there was no mandate from the states to do this. this they, were, they were told to come and fix the articles. They had no mandate from the states to actually replace the articles. Now, here again, we find a unique situation to American history. Uh, what happens? Many of the members of the convention were also members of the Continental Congress. They decided to go before uh, the Continental Congress, which was in recess, and basically asked them to come together and say, and said, look, we can't fix these. These, these. these are garbage, and we need to start over again. And the Continental Congress basically gives their blessing. That is not common, right? That is, it's just not common to see a government give its consent to the possible dismantling of their said government. But this is what happens. And so um, once that's decided, the big debate centered around the legislature. How was it going to be structured? Two plans emerged. And the first is the Virginia plan by James Madison. This was a plan that was going to um, have two uh, houses, a upper and lower house, where the lower house would be based on population. So the bigger the state's population, the bigger the number of delegates of that state. Now, the upper house, which was uh, going to be called a Senate, was going to be uh, based off of population as well. And it's rather convoluted. So for the upper house, all 13 states would submit names nominees that they would like to offer as possible senators. That list of names would go before the House of Representatives, and then the House would vote on which members would be sent to the Senate. Uh, this infuriated the smaller states, led by New Jersey. So the smaller states believed that the Virginia plan would render all of the small states completely um, uh, redundant, or just absolutely useless and powerless. So they threatened to leave the convention unless their plan, called the New Jersey plan, was uh, approved. This is uh, uh, Patterson of New Jersey. And basically it called for keeping it keeping the Congress unicameral, meaning one house, and having equal representation of all the states. So no matter how big the state was, they still got the same number of votes. This, this, uh, this actually gridlocked the, con the convention and almost ended the convention right there. Um, what happens is what's referred to as the Great Compromise, also called the Connecticut Compromise, Roger Sherman drafts this from Connecticut. <clears throat> and this compromise gives us what we have today. Bicameral legislature, the lower house is by population, and the upper house is equal representation per state. So every state gets two senators, and then every state gets uh, a number of, of uh, representatives based on their population. Everyone must at least get one 
but uh, all additionals are, are based off of um, the number of people residing in your state. Now, this resolved one problem, but added another. <clears throat> Who counted as residents? And now, <clears throat> um, many historians and that I tend to agree with here believe that the three-fifths compromise is the reason why there's going to be a civil war. Uh, this is a constitutional accommodation for slavery. There's no other way to put it. Uh, I've heard it argued in, in, in a variety of ways that make it seem a little nicer or not as bad. Um, but push comes to shove. The three-fifths compromise was um, a deal with the devil. So <clears throat> southern states had less population than northern states. This is going to continue right up until the 1980s, really. And um, so when they, they learned that the population of the lower house was going to determine representation, they wanted their slaves to count for the purpose of representation. Now, northerners who had fewer slaves objected. And they did so on, uh, you, I'd like to think were moral grounds, but I actually don't believe that to be true. But anyhow, um, the, um, the northern states said, well, if you're going to count slaves for representation when they don't actually get allowed, they're actually not allowed to vote, well, then we think that slaves should count f as property which will tell us how much in taxes they'll submit, right? Because this is this is the back and forth. This almost stalemates the... Con it, well, it does stalemate. And the southern states threatened to leave. In order to keep the southern states in the Union, the Three-Fifths Compromise was put together. So, um, each slave was to count as three-fifths of a person for both representation and taxation. So this really disgusting formula is done in order to keep all 13 states in the union and to not risk uh, losing uh, members. So uh, the Constitution incorporated a number of principles that we um, collectively refer to as American political culture. So if you are uh, ever taking a government class and, 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 you know, study this part of government, um, the United States does not have ethnic-based citizenship. Our citizenship in this country and the assimilation of people into the country is really based on a shared set of political principles. And these principles, as long as you agree to them, then you can be assimilated into American culture. At least this is the tradition that we hold, right? So first and foremost, we separate powers. We have judicial power, legislative power, and executive power. And uh, this is uh, paired up with federalism. We have the federal government with its powers, and we have the states with their own uh, uh, reserved powers. And these two people are going to govern the country together, right? So just like in England, where the king and the parliament are both sovereign and rule over England, in the United States, you have federal power and state power, and they govern together in a form of dual sovereignty. Uh, government is limited. When you read the Constitution, you'll notice that there are um, uh, a president only serves for four years, and then he has to run for office again. Same uh, representatives every two years, senators every six. So uh, all those tell you that there's limits to power. Individual liberty, The um, eventually we get the um, Bill of Rights. And so, um, uh, you know, this is going to be very important because uh, even the English Bill of Rights did not go as far as the American Bill of Rights. And the nature of the presidency is going to be uh, rather unique. Here, the chief executive um, is charged with ensuring that all the laws passed by Congress are enforced. 
and he did not have the authority to create laws on his own. He does, however, have the power of veto, which means I forbid in Latin. And the veto is uh, put in the Constitution originally for one purpose. And that is if the president feels that the law would not stand up to constitutional scrutiny. Meaning, if a president believes that a law as drafted is violating the Constitution, then he had an obligation to veto it. Now, if the Congress disagrees and can get two-thirds of both houses to vote for the bill, it becomes law without signature. But this presidency was going to have um, a rather large um, power. And, and this was contentious. There were a lot of people who thought, if you're just going to have one executive, why not have a monarch? Um, there was some discussion for a brief amount of time of inviting one of the Prussian princes to come to the United States to be um, America's first king. Other people, particularly in the military, were favoring uh, declaring George Washington to be king. And that was because George Washington had no biological heirs. And so it was believed that he wouldn't be very tyrannical because there would be nothing, no power to hand down to, a, to another generation. The judicial branch uh, was uh, really very... Um, small. It, it's Article 3 of the Constitution. It actually has very little said. Um, the the um, Constitution gave the Congress the power to work out the details of the court. So it actually only established one court in the judicial branch, which was the Supreme Court, and established only one member on that court, the Chief Justice. Uh, this way, Congress can create as many courts underneath the Supreme Court as they want to, and they can do that by law. So the first one is in uh, the Judiciary Act of 1789, or yeah, 1789, and that is the first time the Congress sets up what are called subordinate courts, courts of appeals and district courts. So um, this becomes pretty important because we're going to have these countervailing forces of the new government. So you're going to have this move by people in Congress to establish their authority. The president's going to try to establish what we today consider to be the traditional uh, powers of a president under Washington. And then, of course, the Supreme Court is going to try to um, impose itself as a separate um, third and independent power in government. So <clears throat> what we get here is Constitution Day. Um, at the time, I'm actually recording this on the, 20, um, uh, the 23rd of September. So on September 17th, we uh, technically have Constitution Day in the United States, although unfortunately it is uh, not really given a lot of um, uh, press or attention in the United States. So uh, once the Constitution was drafted... Uh, the, the framers decided that the people had to ratify this document. Now, how, what, what did this mean? Um, the, the Constitution of the United States was to grant sovereignty to a new form of government without a king, without any kind of designated uh, authority to rule, which we call legitimacy. The men who drafted the Constitution, who are called the framers because they created the framework of American law and government, the framers decided that they had to get their sovereignty directly from the people, what we call popular sovereignty. So in Article uh, 7, they laid out the rules of how the states had to ratify the document. So each state had to hold an election. And the election was for the purpose of deciding uh, delegates who would go to a separate ratifying convention per state. And so um, they were allowed to debate the uh, Constitution as much as they want, but it had to be a straight up or down vote. No, no amendments, no deletions, no corrections. They had to vote yes or no. Nine states had to ratify for the document to go into effect. And immediately, two groups emerge. Uh, 
As I said earlier, Hamilton was basically the leader of the Federalists. And the Federalists feared the chaos that they saw in the uh, period of the Articles of Confederation. And they wanted a strong central government. So they approved the Constitution and wanted it ratified. Anti-Federalists were what we would today call states' rights advocates. These were people who either loved the Articles of Confederation or, even if they didn't like the Articles, still liked the idea of 13 independent states who cooperated for various limited reasons. And so these two groups started to, let's say, debate through the mail, right? They're going to write a series of news articles and counter articles for or against uh, ratification. So the arguments for ratification were really pretty straightforward. <clears throat> the state rivalries were creating unbelievable economic chaos. And a lot of people were going to uh, lose everything that they had uh, economically because this new country was not producing a strong enough economy because of the chaos. In addition, Shay's rebellion to a Federalist was the wake-up call. Somebody needed to be what they referred to as an umpire, right? Somebody had to step in to negotiate rivalries between states and, more importantly, help states to control any, uh, uh, let's call it, social disruption that could happen. And so uh, the, the national government had to be given more authority. And the, and the Constitution did exactly that. In Article 1, Section 8, are a list of powers that only the federal government can do. And they were called the expressed powers. Now, the arguments against ratification were essentially the opposite. The more you centralized authority, according to the anti-federalist, the bigger chances you have of creating a tyrannical government. So starting a brand new government located in some distant space away from all of the other states, at least their capitals, was going to permit this new government to become all powerful and all authoritative and lead to tyranny. And for them, that was not acceptable. So if you notice what's going to happen, right, is the, th the 13 states begin to debate. <clears throat> now... Delaware is the first state to ratify. But there's immediately problems. Anti-Federalists start to argue that there are no safeguards against a tyrannical national government. And so um, it's going to take until 1791 to get all the states to ratify. And what happens is... Uh, the whole thing almost came to an end when the states of Virginia and New York started to debate the uh, ratification. This is when the writings of both sides become very critical. Our, our book only talks about the Federalist Papers. I would really strongly encourage everyone to read the Anti-Federalist Papers. Um, they are very telling and in many ways prophetic. Uh, they they predict things like the national debt and all these other things that we confront today uh, because there's too much concentration of power in Washington. Uh, so at the time, anti-federalists in New York and Virginia refused to ratify the Constitution unless there was a Bill of Rights. And uh, Madison really tries to not do it. He and he and Hamilton argue very strongly that a Bill of Rights at the national level was uh, redundant because all the states already had Bills of Rights. Now, um, uh, Hamilton was a lot more draconian about this than, than Madison. Uh, you know, Hamilton was just like, look, this is the way it is and you need to either vote yay or nay and shut up. Uh, Madison was more uh, delicate about it. He argued the argument that Hamilton made, which was that these were redundant lists of rights, if you've already been articulated. But he also um, cautioned people that if you sit down to write down all the rights that people have, you could technically forget some. Uh, 
And does that mean that people don't have those rights since they're not listed? And so Hamilton really sort of, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, Madison really drags his feet here. And it's only when he's confronted with the reality that New York and Virginia, the two biggest states really, were about to reject the document that that Madison gives this, um, I'm going to call it gentleman's agreement. Basically Hamilton, or I'm sorry, uh, Madison basically says to the delegates in New York and in Virginia, where he is, uh, that if they ratify the document, he promised that the first thing the new Congress will do is draft a Bill of Rights. And based on that promise, uh, they get they get ratified. And New Hampshire's the ninth state to ratify. And that's what puts uh, these documents into effect. Rhode Island is the last, which is not surprising at all, because Rhode Island said, we're not going to ratify based on a promise. We'll wait and see what those documents actually look like, right? They, they're like, show us these a bill of rights and then we'll ratify and so um the first uh 12 amendments are proposed 10 of which get ratified and uh rhode island jo joins the union in 1791 so with the ninth state's ratification the government is formed so there are elections held and of course george washington is elected our first president so if you could see from this document from our text Right. This is um, the the actual order of ratification and how they were done. And if you notice, right, New York and Virginia actually, you know, are after New Hampshire. So there's a there there was really a lot of contention here, and and so um, Madison feels compelled to to step forward, and then he does in fact draft 12, 12 amendments. So here's this is the local newspaper published. Uh, uh, the Constitution in 1787 to allow Americans across the country to read it and talk about it. And this is one of the, um, uh, uh, I don't want to, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called a masthead, which is a, a newspaper um, lauding this new document. So it was a, a newspaper run by Federalists. So America in 1789, which is the first year of the Constitution, is very different than what we would see today. It's predominantly agricultural. Uh, it has a brand new government that hasn't been proven yet. It is um, a government based on a Republican form of government, which means that people vote for representatives who then go to a body and vote on their behalf. There is going to be no king. Instead, we're going to have a president, which some people didn't even know what that meant. Uh, the executive branch was new to the national government. If you guys remember, the Articles of Confederation had no executive branch. And of course, there's uh, the Department of State is the first uh, federal department created. Um, and it's, it's um, uh, very different than what you and I will recall when we think of this department. Today, we think of it as handling foreign policy. At the time, the Department of State did all of the foreign policy, but it also handled all of the eternal internal workings of the federal government. So it handled all of the domestic and foreign policy of the United States. And as you'll find out uh, as we go on here, um, almost all of the first presidents, except for Washington, are former secretaries of state. So, um, uh, and John Adams, excuse me. So, uh, John Adams is our first vice president. So Jefferson is Washington's secretary of state. Madison is Jefferson's secretary of state. Monroe is Madison's secretary of state. And then John Quincy Adams is Monroe's secretary of state. And they all take, uh, office after the president. And this is largely, in my opinion, because they really were running the government. They were the literally the secretary of the state of the United States. And so um, they had quite a bit of experience uh, taking office. The secretary of the treasury, or, I'm sorry, secretary of state was going to be uh, Thomas Jefferson, an anti-federalist. Uh, the secretary of the treasury is Alexander Hamilton, who is a federalist. 
The Department of Justice is going to be led by somebody called the Attorney General, uh, who was a Federalist. And then the judicial branch was going to be added, which we didn't have before. And our first uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court will be John Jay of New England, who is also a, a Federalist. Um, there's also going to be a Postmaster General who was, a, if I remember correctly, a um, Anti-Federalist. And then there was also the Secretary of War, who is um, uh, um, General Knox from, from the uh, Revolution. <clears throat> and then, of course, the Bill of Rights are added in 1791. Now, the second, I should say, the next feature that's unique to the American political structure is this idea of religious freedom. In Western civilization, there had never really been a place, with the exception of the Netherlands, where total religious freedom was practiced. And even in the Netherlands, there was uh, a, a, a restriction in the sense that um, you weren't allowed to proselytize in, in the Netherlands, right? You were, you were given this freedom of expression, but then you had to kind of keep to yourself. And so um, <clears throat> now Virginia is the first state to actually come up with um, a policy on religious freedom, and it's drafted by um, Madison and Jefferson. Uh, Rhode Island had always been a haven of religious freedom ever since uh, Roger Williams created the colony. But uh, what happens is the First Amendment to the Constitution, which is obviously the, the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, is on freedom of expression. And one of those is the freedom of conscience, which is that all Americans are allowed to worship whatever way they wish and can choose not to worship if they so choose. And that the federal government is forbidden from establishing an official state church. So this is another form of uh, revolutionary thinking for the period. It is definitely a radical thing in terms of political structure. Most, most European countries had an official state church. And uh, even, in, even in countries where uh, you didn't have to belong to the state church, your taxes still supported that church, as in, was the case in the Church of England, right? What we in America call the Episcopal Church and what is called the Anglican Church in England um, is still supported by the national treasury. So here's Alexander Hamilton, right? Uh, under the new government, he is the secretary of the treasury from 1789 to 1795. <clears throat> he leaves office when, um, right before Washington steps, steps down. And, uh, there were a number of issues for this new government that had to be uh, addressed. And the Congress asked Hamilton to come up with some ideas. For raising revenue, the new Constitution gave the federal power the sole authority to tax imports, called a tariff. Now, the tariff was going to be the main source of revenue for the government, period. Now, uh, the idea was to have what's called a revenue tariff, which is a low rate, which would uh, collect a lot of revenue that the government would function on. As a point of fact, the federal government is going to function primarily based on a tariff until 1913 when we pass an income tax. So the tariff becomes the main source of revenue. Uh, Hamilton also recommended an excise tax on alcohol. An excise tax is a per unit tax, meaning you pay the same amount for every unit consumed. So today we call them sin taxes because they're usually taxes on things that you're not supposed to be consuming. Cigarettes, alcohol, gasoline, tires. So when you pump gas, you're paying so many cents per gallon pumped. And what Alexander Hamilton wanted a um, an excise on every bottle of alcohol sold. Uh, this causes a great problem, which we'll talk about later. 
The next had to deal with the debt. Hamilton wanted the federal government to assume the debts accumulated by the states, which was about $21 million. And he wanted to do this because he wanted all of the states to, in a sense, uh, develop uh, together. And, he, and some states had no debts. Some states paid off their debts. Some states like Massachusetts couldn't get their debts paid. And uh, so he wanted the federal government to, to pay off those debts. <clears throat> now, um, he wanted them to do this, and there was resistance. Uh, Jefferson and, and Madison objected because Virginia paid off its debts. And they didn't believe that uh, Virginia should have to take on more responsibility to pay off the debts of other states. And so um, <clears throat> they resisted. But Jefferson wanted to keep the peace. So he held a meeting in his home in Washington. And he invited Hamilton and Madison to dinner along with some other people. And they hammered out a deal. Some people call it the Compromise of 1791. But basically... Uh, the southern states gave up their objections to the assumption of debt and the northerners agreed to allow Washington to choose where the new federal city would be located and it would be located somewhere in the south. So George Washington chose the location of the new federal city, which we today call Washington, D.C. And he chose a spot that was virtually visible from his home at Mount Vernon. Next what to do with the national debt now that it was going to be $75 million. Hamilton argued that to pay it all off would take about five to 10 years and would require all of the nation's revenues. And, and Hamilton believed that that was just not practicable. But we did have all this land, over a million acres of land to sell. And Hamilton believed that over time, we would sell enough land to, to surrender the debt. But in the meantime, we owed money to foreign governments. We owed money to foreign banks. We owed uh, money to American merchants, to American soldiers who were paid in IOU notes. And Hamilton said that, you know, you could foment a rebellion. So what he wanted to do was float the debt what we today call the bond market. So <clears throat> this was very controversial. So rather than pay all the debt off at once, issue a, a bond for every dollar of debt somebody is holding. And as long as they hold that debt, the government would pay them 4% a year. Now, this was going to be $1 of debt gets you $1 of bond. The Southerners objected because this is called funding at par. One dollar of debt, one dollar of bond. But a lot of people had sold their debts to speculators. Uh, you have to imagine, this is the war was ended in 1783. It's now 1790s and there's been no payment of the debt. So people began to speculate on to whether the government would ever pay that debt. So people with money were going up to uh, former soldiers and merchants and, and some even local investors and saying, hey, uh, I understand that you have $1,000, let's say hypothetically, in uh, uh, debts. I'll give you $500 in gold for your $1,000 of IOUs. And a lot of people had sold their debt under those circumstances because they didn't think they'd ever get paid. So better half than nothing. Well, Hamilton proposed rewarding those speculators with a full $1 to $1 uh, uh, bond payment. And again, Jefferson, Madison, and others found that reprehensible because um, it was basically rewarding people who took advantage of other people who were in bad financial straits. Hamilton argued that you had to reward these people because these were the guys with money. And if they didn't get rewarded for their risk, they would not risk any more money on America. And this is the birth of the bond market. Virtually all governments in the world issue debt via bond sales, as do private corporations and states. And so uh, uh, this is how we decided to treat the debt. We floated it. 
and it's going to not uh, the 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 debt from the war will not be surrendered completely until um, eighteen thirty six when the the debt will be uh, at zero. So right away we have the emergence of sectional differences. Um, Hamilton then proposes to have a national bank like the Bank of England. This is the big uh, separation point for James Madison. James Madison was a Federalist. He supported the Constitution. He supported the new federal government. He resisted a Bill of Rights uh, because he thought that the federal government should have the flexibility to respond as, an, uh, as a true umpire among the states or between the states. But as soon as the government went into action, Madison starts to move in Jefferson's direction. He doesn't like the idea of floating the debt. He definitely did not like funding at par. When Hamilton proposes a national bank, this is what makes Madison switch sides. He will become an anti-federalist at this point. Uh, Madison uh, also objected to um, using a tariff in order to support domestic manufacturers. So Hamilton believed in raising the rate on the um, raising the rate on the tariff in order to encourage Americans to buy American-made products, and this was very controversial because there's nothing in the Constitution that says that the federal government has the power to use the tariff for the purpose of protection. And again, Southerners uh, felt um, uh, kind of attacked because. Uh, there weren't very many manufacturing endeavors in the South, but there were a lot of agricultural endeavors in the South. And um, they feared that when the United States raised tariffs on foreign governments, those governments were going to raise tariffs on American products, which is in fact what happens. It's one of the reasons if you're following the current, you know, Donald Trump uh, issues, right? His, his tariffs against China have caused a lot of problems. Why? Well, because... For Americans who sell products to China, now China has retaliated. And, and this is exactly what happened. So uh, Hamilton's biggest opponent is going to be Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson's really responsible for the birth of the first parties because um, he forms a group to fight against the federal government called the Anti-Federalists. So... Uh, the Federalist who believed in, who feared chaos and wanted a strong central government, uh, believed in a loose construction. And what this means is um, uh, Hamilton decided that the, the, the a national bank was constitutional because the federal government says that they should have as much power as they need to do their job. This is a very loose interpretation of the document. Uh and it's referred to as the necessary and proper clause or the elastic clause. As you read in the text, you'll get this, right? And this allows for Federalists to kind of stretch the meaning of the Constitution, which is why some people call it the elastic clause. The Republicans, or the Democratic Republicans, were the anti-Federalists. They feared tyranny, and so they wanted states' rights. To them, Strict construction was the way to go. And basically what you want to do here is they mean a literal interpretation of the document. And their uh, argument rests on what's called the Tenth Amendment. This is the last of the Bill of Rights. And the Tenth Amendment gives us what are called the reserved powers of the states. So if you read the Tenth Amendment, it basically says any powers not delegated to the federal government, which are the expressed powers, and not denied to the states are reserved as state powers. So uh, Jefferson and others will say, well, if that power isn't listed in the Constitution, it's not a federal power. It is a state power. And that's why they go with strict construction. It's a literal interpretation of the Constitution. If the word bank isn't in the Constitution, well, then the federal government does not have the power to have a bank. And that's what Matt Jefferson argues to Washington. There is nothing in the express powers that says the word bank. Washington sides with, Mattis, or with Hamilton, however, because Hamilton argues that the necessary and proper clause says that he should have any powers he needs to do his job. 
and the and and the Constitution clearly says that the uh, that the federal government has to coin money, handle national debt, uh, exchange foreign currency, and he says, "How am I going to do this without a bank?" And Washington agreed, but to appease Jefferson, he gave the new bank a twenty-year charter, and so the bank was established in seventeen ninety-one, but given a charter until eighteen eleven. And I want you to remember that because that becomes important later on. So originally the French Revolution was viewed as a, a great thing in the United States because uh, it was just like our revolution, or at least we thought we we're going to get rid of monarchy and we're going to establish a true republic. Now, all that changes in 1792 when France declared war on Prussia and Austria and began to slaughter their nobility. Um, Federalists, right? The Federalists are going to immediately look at this and what's called the reign of terror and point to that and say, see, that's what happens when chaos breaks out. And that's why you need strong central authority. Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists will look at that and say, no, this is how hard you have to fight when tyranny gets that entrenched. Right? Jefferson writes a phrase, I believe to Abigail Adams, where he says, well, you know, the tree of liberty must oft be fed by the blood of tyrants and patriots, which she found just horrifying. Um, but the problem was the United States was in an alliance with France, 1778. And so uh, Washington uh, proclaims neutrality in 1793. He basically comes out and he says, look, um, we are friends with everybody. We're not out to pick a fight with anyone. Um, we respect our alliance with France, but we are not going to declare war on anybody and he tells the American people that they have to stay out of this conflict, right? that they cannot uh, partake in this. Jefferson is furious. He feels that we have an obligation under the treaty to support France and to uh, defend uh, France against their foreign enemies and to support the revolution. Uh, John Adams and others are just appalled. I mean, the revolutionaries in France start uh, guillotining people uh, 24 hours a day and and dragging priests and nuns out into the street and killing them. It's, it's really very uh, horrific. So uh, the new government in France sends an ambassador uh, named Citizen Genet. Now, this sounds really weird because when you read it, you think, who in their right mind would call their kid Citizen? But this is because the revolutionary government in France outlawed titles. So um, no one could no no one could be uh, lord or, or or a count or king, right? All those titles were abolished, and everybody was going to be addressed the same way, citizen. So just like we would say Mister or Mrs. in France, everybody was going to be citizen. So whoever, right? So citizen Genet comes to the United States to be the ambassador for France, and he's a troublemaker from day one. He tries to form Jacobin groups in all of these places to uh, be pro-French and to go out and to literally sabotage British shipping. Washington gets furious. By the time Genet reaches D.C., Washington wants to kick his butt. Jefferson asks for Washington to please let Genet speak to him. I think he's about 18 or 19 years old. And Washington agrees to a meeting. So Janae comes before Washington and his cabinet and begins to berate George Washington for not living up to his obligations under the Treaty of Alliance. Washington tries to remind him at one point, he says, you need to remember yourself, sir, meaning you, an ambassador, are talking to the head of state of a government. Doesn't work. Uh, Jefferson is humiliated because Janae just literally goes off the handle. Washington declares him persona non grata, which is a diplomatic term meaning a person without gratitude. And that's basically telling France that this guy's not welcome and you need to take him back and send someone else. Now, what happens? So many governments are being turned over in France that new people take power and want Genet to be sent back so he can be executed. 
Jefferson alerts Washington to this and Washington's like, oh crap, I don't, you know, I hate this kid. I don't want him killed, but you know, so he grants him political asylum and it's somewhat unique because uh, Janae will stay in the United States. He will marry the, um, I think he marries one of the governor of New York's daughters and becomes a farmer in New York and becomes a citizen of the United States. Um, next is Jay's treaty. Washington is going to send John Jay to Britain to try to get the British to leave the Northwest Territories. It is a hugely hated treaty in the United States. Uh, John Jay, who's a Federalist, goes to England and he basically gets, um, I don't know if I want to say overwhelmed or just kind of like overly impressed with the British. And basically the British say, look, we'll move our troops when you pay back your debts from the from before the war, which we agreed to in the Treaty of Paris. Um, and Jay signs on to this. And Americans, many of whom owed money to the British, were pissed. And uh, John Jay said that um, in a letter to Washington that he would be able to find his way back to D.C. from New York because he'll just follow the burning effigies to Washington because so many protesters were burning him in, in like little dummies dressed like him. He said there were so many of them, he could light his path all the way to D.C. In the Battle of Fallen Timbers, um, the government is able to fight back uh, Indians, uh, the Battle of Greenville and Stanwix. Uh, the federal government will fight Indians, as I said earlier, and convince the Indians to uh, surrender territory in the Northwest in order for settlers to move west. Then we get what's called the Whiskey Rebellion. This is in 1794-95. Um, uh, Hamilton's tax on whiskey has caused a rebellion. And um, these uh, uh, people in the western part of Pennsylvania had such a difficult time getting their products to market because they couldn't float the products down the river because of Spain's... Uh, 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 barring of U.S. traffic on the Mississippi and the, and the Port of New Orleans. So they had to get their grain to market on the east by literally walking it there. And it would spoil. So the easier way to do it was to distill it into whiskey. Well, this was uh, great because it didn't matter how long. The longer you held onto it, the better it was. And so whiskey started to become the main product of Western farmers. And in fact, it was almost used as a bartering uh, currency for people out in the West. The tax on whiskey now created an additional burden. And so people refused to pay the tax. And so, um, uh, at one, at one point, Washington says, you, you, you've got to pay the tax. And, uh, he leads an army of mostly Virginia militiamen into Western Pennsylvania, where he arrests the ringleaders of this rebellion. He sends them to Philadelphia, has them tried for treason. They're found guilty, and then he pardons them all, uh, which is a very unique thing for, for, uh, for that period. Treason usually meant you were going to hang from a tree. And the fact that none of them get killed was a major show of restraint on the part of Washington. But the point was made. Washington said, you have representation in Congress. They voted for this for this tax. You have to pay the tax. If you don't like it, change your representative and get the, get the law changed. Otherwise, you're paying your taxes. But Washington realized that they had a, a, a genuine problem. So he sends uh, Pinckney, Thomas Pinckney, I believe, to Spain to negotiate with the Spanish. And he gets a treaty where Spain reopened the Mississippi and the port of New Orleans to U.S. Uh, 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 water traffic. And this was a very big boon for, uh, for the president. So, uh, just to sort of wrap up the period of, of George Washington, uh, the land policy becomes really very important here because uh, hopefully everybody can kind of uh, wrap your heads around this because, you know, we're talking about millions and millions of acres of land uh, over a million acres. 
And, you know, Washington has essentially got an agreement from the British to sort of leave us alone, an agreement with the Spanish to give us access to the Mississippi River so those Western lands can be viable commercial property. And then, um, and then basically gave support to a national bank that could be providing financing for that sorts of things, right? So the land policy becomes really very significant. Then Washington gives support for the construction of what's called originally the Wilderness Road. This, this is a painting uh, by uh, George Caleb Bingham of uh, Daniel Boone leading settlers through what's referred to as the Cumberland Gap, which is through uh, Maryland. And it's a, it's a flatter, easier access through the Appalachian Mountains from the East Coast to uh, the Ohio River Valley. And it's, uh, it's, it then becomes known as the National Road. But um, uh, Washington wanted the federal government to support this because this would allow for all of the states to be interconnected so that commerce between the states would flow more freely. Uh, but this created a problem. And the reason for it is uh, there was nothing in the Constitution giving the federal government the power to build what we call infrastructure, roads, canals, bridges, railroads, right, uh, port facilities. There is nothing in Article 1, Section 8 that lists this out as an expressed power of the federal government. And this is going to create tensions between states' rights advocates or anti-federalists and federalists. So as you can see, we begin to, to, to have uh, a clearly defined two-party system. Federalists who believe in a strong central government and anti-federalists who believe in strong states. And the fight will be over both domestic and foreign policy, right? So in foreign policy, federalists support Britain, anti-federalists prefer, prefer France. In domestic policy, it's do you, want, do you want the federal government to have more power or do you want states to have more power? So it becomes pretty pretty straightforward. So th the consequence of this, though, is the federal government does not consistently provide help. So in areas like New England, for instance, where there's a lot of cooperation, you're going to start to see more development economically than you'll see in places like the South, where states won't coordinate with one another and don't want to coordinate with northern states. And so uh, we get variation in, in economic development between the various regions. So uh, when, when uh, George Washington gets through his second term, he makes it very clear that he absolutely refuses to th serve a third. And this is where we get the two-term precedent. Uh, now, there is nothing in the original Constitution limiting presidential terms. That comes with the 22nd Amendment, uh, you know, and that's after FDR. And, but it's, it's Washington's example that's used to make the two-term limit. Washington said that nobody should be elected every term until they die, because that's pretty much an elected monarch. Um, Washington was desperate to get back to Mont, uh, to Mount Vernon uh, to live out his life, because he was just, uh, was really, I mean, in all fairness, just over it. And uh, so John Adams, the vice president, was chosen to be the standard bearer for the Federalist in the 1796 election. So in Washington's farewell address, he warned Americans against uh, overwhelming debt. Uh, he warned us against being too partisan. He, he believed that there shouldn't be parties. Uh, and he warned us against unnecessary permanent foreign entanglements, meaning uh, he, he wanted Americans to detach themselves from, from Europe. And John Adams ran basically on that. Now, in the original Constitution, all the candidates ran for president. Whoever got first place was the president, and whoever got second place was the vice president. So John Adams is going to be the first president to be elected uh, in a partisan race, uh, you know, a truly partisan race. And he's going to be the first president to live in the White House, although he only did it for a few months. This is in early 1801. Uh, but the election of 1796 is the first truly partisan election that we have. And uh, 
a Federalist, John Adams gets first place, but Jefferson, an Anti-Federalist, got second place. So if you can imagine, if this was system was still existed, Donald Trump would be the president right now, and Hillary Clinton would be the vice president. Imagine the imagine the news coverage every day if that were the case, right? I mean, crazy. So now, what happens? Um, we get something called the X Y Z affair. Um, John Adams decides that we have to get out of this treaty with France. So he sends American delegates to Paris to negotiate with the foreign minister of France to end the official alliance of 1778. When they get there, they're approached by three French agents. John Adams will label them agents X, Y, and Z to keep their names anonymous. Uh, they're told by these French agents that they had to pay a bribe of about $250,000 in that t time period before they could even enter negotiations. Now, our delegates are appalled. They refuse and they leave and they write back to the president of their uh, situation. Uh, Adams recounts their story to the Congress in a written message that becomes known as the XYZ affair or the XYZ message. So, this causes Americans to lose their minds and there starts this anti-French fervor in America and a call for war with France. We never actually go to war, but we start building a navy. And that's why people call it the quasi-war or quasi-war. Now, to be fair, it was common practice in foreign policy to pay bribes. And it sounds weird. But um, a lot of diplomats were members of the nobility or members of the upper class. And so uh, they served as diplomats for prestige and also to sort of serve the people. And many of them took on the expense of their, dip their diplomatic mission on their own. So they paid for everything on their own. And so this is expensive. So when you negotiated with a diplomat and you felt that you had come to an understanding, you would give them some token of gratitude to basically demonstrate that you really appreciated them going above and beyond to, to get something done. And it could be, it, it could be something as silly as a beautifully uh, uh, bred horse. It could be a... Um, a, a beautiful jewelry box that's got diamonds encrusted in it or something like that, right? Uh, you can actually go um, to the State Department. I don't know actually if they can do the State Department, but it used to be uh, a collection at the um, Smithsonian Museum in Washington. You could actually go and see some of these gifts that our diplomats got because we don't allow them to keep them. Uh, but back in that day, that's what you, that's supplemented your income. So anyway, uh, people started to clamor for war. Adams didn't want to go to war, but the the Hamilton wing of his own party wanted war with France because they believed that it would uh, it would draw America closer to Britain and that it would it would make the national government more powerful. And Adams really hated Hamilton and Hamilton absolutely hated John Adams. And so Adams goes to his vice president, Jefferson, who's been a friend of his for decades, and asks him to come together with him and work out a way to get past this. Jefferson refuses. He sees an opportunity for his own party uh, to make gains, and, um, and, and he just... Um, refuses to help. And, and Adams is absolutely crushed by this. It, it literally breaks Adams's heart. Uh, the, the story goes that Adams says to Jefferson, we have been friends since before the revolution. Are, are you really going to leave me to hang here? 
and and Jefferson's like, look, you this is this is the party you've chosen. This is, you're the leader of that party. You know, you've got to face this. And he said, do you realize that if 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 you walk if you turn your back on me now, we're we're not friends anymore. And Jefferson supposedly says, well, that would be unfortunate. Kind of like, oh, that's that would be too bad. Adams refuses to speak to him after this. And the war at home is really just a reference to the political fighting between Federalists and Anti-Federalists in the in the in the Adams Adams wing and the and and the, I mean just horrible. So Adams decides to side with the Hamiltonians. And he signs a number of laws that are unbelievably draconian. And they're referred to as the Alien and Sedition Acts. And what they did is they basically made everybody in the United States who was foreign born a suspect as a possible spy or somebody undermining the authority of the federal government. And it gave the president the authority to waive civil liberties if he felt that the country was under attack, which, of course, Adams and Adams thinks that it is. Um, and this causes fury, right? Uh, this is a this is a cartoon of um, the X Y Z affair, and uh, now uh, Jefferson is going to run against uh, Adams, and what he does is he and 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 Madison draft um, a, a two documents. They're called the um, Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, and these were. Uh, Basically, resolutions passed by the legislatures of Kentucky and Virginia stating that the acts that I just listed there were, in fact, unconstitutional. And because they were unconstitutional, the states didn't have to obey them. Now, this is a theory called nullification. And this is going to be the theory that the southern states are going to be using to justify going to war in 1865, uh, 1861. And so it's a it's a rather dangerous philosophy that gets introduced by Jefferson and Madison. Mind you, Jefferson's the vice president of the United States, and he's literally doing this behind the back of his of the president. I mean, it's chaos, utter chaos. So when we get to 1800, these two men can't even be in the same room with each other, and they run against each other again, and it is a knockdown, drag out brawl. Uh, when people say to me sometimes that uh, campaign ads today are so ridiculous and, and negative, I always tell them, go look up the, the election of 1800. I mean, you know, uh, Adams was um, suspected of using the uh, White House as a, uh, basically as like a hotel where he rents it out and he, he hires prostitutes for uh, foreign dignitaries and uh, just all kinds of stuff going on. Adams, uh, one of his newspapers, is the ones that is going to circulate the rumor that Jefferson had fathered a child through one of his slaves, which we now believe to have been the truth, or at least somebody in the, some male in the Jefferson family fathered uh, children with Sally Hemings. And so, what happens, however, is the election of 1800 is a sweep. Uh, the Republicans win both first and second place. And uh, they take both houses of the Congress. And this is an unbelievable event. Now, that brawl convinces the government that this cannot happen. So we're going to get what's called the 12th Amendment. So uh, the 12th Amendment ended this practice. And instead, um, you know, when you run, you either run for president or you run for vice president. There's two separate ballots that are that are done. And so um, uh, Jefferson and, and Aaron Burr as the vice president are going to take over. Uh, John Adams is so upset that he refuses to stay for Jefferson's inauguration. It's considered by some to be the end of the critical period because we get the first peaceful transition of power from one faction to another. So uh, the the uh, reign of power went from Federalist to Republican without any bloodshed, which had really not happened in modern history. And so, um, uh, you know, Jefferson um, is going to take over power and quickly realizes uh, that 
ideology does not necessarily translate smoothly into action. And so our, uh, our next uh, installment will be on Jefferson and the early Republic of the United States.